everybody. Um, today's uh, last panel is going to be sort of a, an amalgamation of, of a lot of uh, important voices that we've featured over the last year since our last summit. Uh, we have Dr. Grander back from Arizona. We have Sam Juanita Sanchez uh, from Texas. We have Eugenia Brooks from Brooklyn. And we have Teresa Schumard from Philadelphia. And somewhere in, in, in the dark ether is Will Hedepole. Uh, from the hills of Marin, and as soon as he gets uh, logged in here, uh, we'll, we'll let him sum it all up. Uh, but with that, Teresa, uh, the ball is yours, the baton is yours, and take it away. Thank you, Adam. It's really, it's really been an amazing day today. I'm so happy to see all that has been said and done today with the coming together of health professionals and patients. It's just, it's amazing and it's healthy. And I just can't thank our esteemed experts enough this morning. They did such a great job and um, our frontline workers and uh, guests. Amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I know that this group here on this session has been listening closely to what has been said and and a lot more has been said than I really anticipated. I mean, they went to places that were very, so very interesting. Um, and I, I would like to first call on uh, Dr. Grandner, if he could give us a little bit of, you know, takeaway from what he heard this morning with Dr. Sai and, um, Dr. Ohian and Dr. Vitiello, uh, they were. It was very good. And um, yeah, the, there's a, there's a lot there, but I think I think a, ver a very important take home, um, knowing that there's going to be a lot we're going to be talking about. Something that really struck me in listening to everybody was that this whole you know the, the focus on COVID and isolation and 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 the experience of patients and what's going on. It, it's, it's, it was very, it was very interesting how it's simultaneously a global event, but also a very personal event. And, and that really in what everyone was talking about, I mean, it's crazy talking about France and Spain and Canada and the issue of borders and all these issues and hospitals, but at the same time, we're talking about like where people are sleeping tonight and are people afraid to use their CPAPs or like, and, and all these things. And, and I just think, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot that's been talked about this for the last bunch of weeks. And, and I think um, that that is the biggest take home message for me is that, you know, this is a, this is something to think about on a global scale and a population scale, but you don't, but, also on a personal patient level in your home, in your bedroom sort of scale where it's affecting everybody, um, not just sleep apnea patients, but also sleep apnea patients. And there's so many questions about, about the role of sleep apnea and infection risk and all, all this stuff. We don't know, to be honest. We don't know. Like, this is new. No, no, there's no randomized controlled trial of sleep apnea and COVID-19 that hasn't been done. We don't know. But I think, I think it's really important for everyone to remember that everything they're going through is real, um, that no one knows all the answers, and we're all doing the best we can. And, and I think that, to me, that was really the most important take-home message. <laughs> Eugenia, I'm so happy to see you here today. And we've, we've been talking with you closely, you know, over the last seven weeks about, you know, some of the things that you you know, have, have gone through and, and seen, you know, up there in your neck of the woods. And, uh, but I would just like to see if you had some takeaways from uh, what you heard from um, Austin and Kevin this morning and Rich when they were talking about, uh, you know, some of the difficulties of like Rich, for instance, talking about truck drivers and many of whom are our patients can't can't even get clean um, restroom facilities on the road and things like that. And I know that you have been through some personal things up there. Did anything resonate with you, hard Absolutely. this morning? Absolutely, a lot of things resonated with me because, first of all, 
Um, I felt for rich and I feel for the working class because, you know, in, in my quest of life, you know, I did many things over the years and I mean, just simple things like taking a road trip to go visit family. I know what he speaks about the rest stops and how important the spots along the way are. And, you know, I can understand. I can't imagine, you know, going to see the family down in Virginia and not being able to make the customary stops along the way and get out and stretch your legs and get something to eat and go to the, you know, restroom and and here these people are working and they're on schedules and they've got to be somewhere by a certain hour and um, there's nothing there. They, and then you're suffering from sleep apnea. And I know, okay, mine got to the point where I couldn't make it for a 20 minute ride from Perth Amboy to Newark without falling asleep behind the wheel and having to pull over and get out and walk. And I can't imagine trying to drive an 18 wheeler with a full load and I'm falling asleep behind the wheel. <laughs> it's just a nightmare to me. And yeah, you know, it, what about, what about what um, the, uh, rich Bren's son was saying, uh, Austin, and he was talking about, you know, coming oh, home from shift, getting to, having yeah. to, you know, launder his clothing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, right there, it's, it's very important not to carry that through the house. I mean, well, Austin and, and Kevin too. Okay, being healthcare workers on the front lines and what they must be going through because they're going in to the hospitals and you know the, also the uh, the uh, uh, going into people's homes to get them to bring them to the hospital and they're they're walking the gauntlet. And being exposed and then having to worry about not bringing it home to their family or being separated from their family to ensure that they're not doing it. Um, and our whole, our whole bottom line, our whole existence has changed. And we have to rethink how we've been doing things. And in a way, it's a good thing because it's making us be self-aware about what we're doing and how we're doing it in terms of ourselves, our families, and others, okay? But also, it's a very difficult change because, you know, we've, we've lived in this fantasy for so long where we had no worries and there were no issues and Eugene, yeah. let, let, let me cut you off a second because I, I know we could go all day what, right. what's going on in your backyard right now what's going on in my backyard is going on same thing that's going on in everyone's backyard okay i mean well they just i just got the notice while we were uh in session here that they've extended new york has extended the pause uh, for another two weeks. Um, What's going on in your building? In my building? You know, this is a building for people with both mental and physical disabilities. Right. And so it's, it's dicey to say the least because you have, you know, people with the mental issues don't understand what's going on, that it's going on, Okay, they just feel like they're being sequestered against their will and they're railing against that. They want to do what they want to do. They want it to be normal. They don't understand why when they go out on the street, people shy away from them that are in the neighborhood and know who they are because they've lived here for years. I mean, you know, it's the same thing that's going on with everybody. It's a very difficult situation. So, so that being said, San Juanito, you want to sort of tell us what's going on in your neck of the woods in Texas? Sure. Um, you know, I live in the most southern part of Texas, and we were uh, one of the first to open up the state. And down in our area, um, here in the Rio Grande Valley, we are just starting to increase areas for testing. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that these testings uh, must be uh, 
by doctor's orders or there is a fee associated with getting tested, which can be challenging for the population here in our area. Um, so there's a lot of things that uh, we're a little bit slower in getting to that we've seen in other parts of the country. Um, we do have, I suppose, generally a bit lower numbers, but I goes back to the testing amount. Um, so, uh, and we have vulnerable populations. One of the things, if I may, Adam, go into uh, what Dr. Satius was saying, uh, I think it's, it's so important. And that is that the people, um, there's an outreach because, you know, the way we're doing medicine now, the way we're getting diagnosed now, so different and there has to be outreach by our community members to be able to get to our rural areas one of the challenges we have down here and i'm going to talk about our area is that we um have transportation issues so these uh, telemedicine is fantastic in that way in that we can come into your home however there's challenges as to internet access and so um it really is a weighing of um advantages and disadvantages um and i'm going to get real personal here uh, my there's four of us that live in our home we're all apnea sleep apnea patients we all use our cpap machines and we had our first uh, doctor's visit with our um uh, sleep doctor and uh my brother who's not familiar with technology uh was definitely seemed pretty anxious about it um so i was able to attend with him by using my uh, device to get him on and one of the things though that the the doctor made and kind of going to what dr uh Oberstein said it's very important it is it has to be patient friendly um we definitely have more access and it was a great easy way to come on uh they came on first the um practitioner and then the doctor came on a little bit later uh we had to wait just like in the doctor's office but you know we were in the comfort of our home and we did go through the session so it was painless in that way, but we had that ability to do it. And then we have to do a drive, drive through to take our machine in for readings, but, uh, it, it, it took place. So I think, um, you know, the, the I think the statement from Dr. Oberstein was, um, we have to be in the front lines. It's changing. We're becoming more active, but not losing sight of the fact that we do need that outreach because a lot of our members of our community may not have that accessibility. Uh, but um, I think that one of the things is there's there's definitely um, an improvement in getting access to our rural areas in our area. But again, we work on technology. So, um, you know, we're changing with time, but uh, we've had our first visit and it went pretty well. I wanted to share that point with you. How did you how did you uh, feel about uh, the Dr. Azizi and El Dr. Elena Oberstein's uh, conversation this morning when they were talking about how things are changing for them as, um, you know, their patients are concerned and some of the new normal, you know, things that we're, we're you know, experiencing? Well, I think... I think the final point made, and I think Adam touched on it, it was, you know, uh, we're doing what we, the best that we can, which is a great opportunity to actually access our, our health providers, but it's not the end of all. I mean, we definitely need that contact. And so, um, you know, I can go into the doctor with my sleep apnea and I could have said, you know, my readings are great. But have you seen what's happening with my legs? I've got some markings that are associated with my apnea, and you would not have been able to see that uh, by just our teleconferencing. I, I think you're seeing it even here with your connection. Um, you I mean, know, there it, is definitely has to be a, a happy medium and ability to. So, Sam, we need to, I don't mean to cut you off, but yes. your connect your connection's so going it's, in. It's like it, uh, your your connection's going in and out. So we're we're okay. we're, we're gonna we're gonna go to, back to Dr. Grander before okay. we uh, we let will will sort of uh, give us a summary of, of this day. Um, but I think the technology will become eventually one of our, our, our themes and symposiums that we focus on. It's the technology of the internet and using the telemedicine. It's the technology of being able to see our data and are we using it too much and, and how do we best use it in this new COVID era? So right. with that, Dr. Dr. Grander. Yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, the, this issue of mental health. And, you know, I've talked before 
about the relationship between sleep apnea and, and mental health and how just having sleep apnea can be difficult, um, not only physically, um, but mentally as well. And right now, you know, I think as we're socially distancing, which is somehow leading to social isolation for people, people are feeling alone, people are feeling like they can't really interact with their providers very much. I mean, I don't know if I, don't know if I brought this up um, when we were talking uh, earlier in the week, but, you know, at least... Here in Pima County in Arizona, um, the suicide rate has more than doubled in the past month from the month previous. Um, they looked at uh, five weeks in February into March and five weeks from March into April, and, and it, it's a more than doubling of the suicide rate in the population. And when you look at the key risk factors of things like job loss and relationship stress and illness stress and, you know, and... and it just goes. It just goes to show that that this is touching a lot of people in a lot of really important ways, and it's important to know what to do when you are struggling. And that, you know, the one thing about telehealth in my world, where in mental health, actually, it's built for telehealth. I mean, we don't have to be in the room physically with a patient, but if I can look you in the eye and we could talk. Yeah. Um, it can make a big difference. I mean, all of my colleagues, like almost all of them are all on, on telehealth platforms right now. And I just want to tell people that, you know, if you're struggling, you know, that there are resources out there, maybe even more so than traditional medicine right now. Um, and, and, and I, I, I definitely wanted to talk about that. I, I think it needs yeah. to be said. I think this is something that patients are experiencing and I think they shouldn't be ashamed of it. I think this is a consequence of the time and we shouldn't hide from it. I'm I'm not usually at a loss of words, but I think uh, I, I mean considering that you spoke about the timing of suicide at our last awake summit. Yep. Uh, I never thought we would be here in May saying, "Oh my God, this the suicide rate just doubled overnight because yeah. the world has changed." Right. And that, and I, I I don't know if this is outside of Pima County. Actually, we've right. been I, when I, since I saw that we started making calls all around the country to see if we can get data. We haven't gotten any responses yet. But, we, but it, it would be, if this is something that's not just here in Pima County, um, where it's still single digits to other single digits, but it, it's higher, you know, we might have a public health issue on our hands. And I think, you know, it, it's important to know. Absolutely. Well, I would like to ask you what you took away from Dr. Borelli. You know Dr. Borelli for a long time. Um, yeah. and he's, um, he was going through, it sounded like he was going through some medical issues during the end of, you know, yeah. this period of time. Would you like to give us some insight to that? Sure. I'm, I'm smiling because, uh, he describes his diarrhea, um, as one of the symptoms of, uh, potential symptoms of COVID, um, and I had the same thing. And I was, I was like, and I, I looked at the same study. It was like 28% of the people in, in that study presented with that as a symptom. And I was like, oh, I, I was already through it by then. I was like, oh, I hope maybe I had the virus and, I, and I'm going to be immune. But I'm also saddened by the fact that I can't just go and find out and uh, yeah. I can't order tests, right? The other thing that struck me uh, in his talk is he sort of glossed over it, but it's like a huge problem, which is he had 7,000 uh, MRIs or whatever scans that he used to do down to 1,500. Um, that's got to be really stressful for anybody who runs a business. Um, and I have a sister who lives not too far from here, and she's you know on the verge of losing her business as well as her her income. Um, everybody had to be laid off and, and – uh, it was really complex getting this loan from the, from the government and she may or may not have gotten it. And so that's going to have a huge stress on people. And I can just see it in my, in my sibling who's undiagnosed sleep apnea doesn't help. Um, and there's a huge cascading effect, you know, of, of uh, delaying uh, uh, all these, these scans because people might have things that they actually have to attend to. And that's going to have a catastrophic potentially effect on some people. I also just um, on the technology side, you know, he was alluding to it, but you know, he now has a business that's in the cloud and 
And that's great because, you know, you don't have to worry about the hard drive underneath your desk getting kicked and then losing all your data. But the, the, the potentially less great thing is if we have like a really big resurgence and we have the big wave that people might be um, saying could come, you know, those folks, the, the essential workers behind the scenes that are keeping those clouds running. I used to run a cloud-based business and I had two data centers. If you lose a couple of key employees and then something goes wrong, you could be in big trouble just from a business interruption point of view. Uh, and I don't think people are thinking about that too much, but that there's a second wave of essential workers, I think, uh, that that um, could be affected. It's the frontline workers now, but then it's the, the it's the, the people who are keeping everything running. Uh, so he yeah. pointed that out. I also thought that this whole uh, link to, he kept saying cancer, you know, COVID could cause cancer. It's, a, it's just kind of a way of getting the attention and saying, you know, we just don't know what it could cause, but certainly he pointed out that it can cause mental problems with the with the hippocampus, which then creates memories and, and lays those things down in the right in the right way. Um, and you know, uh, what I've heard from most people is you just do want do not want to get on a ventilator, you know, because that just kind of causes a whole bunch of those um, bad situations to make it worse. Um, and so the long-term injury is being kind of not talked about. Uh, it's being a little bit downplayed, and I think that that's something that'll probably come up. The last thing I, I, I was going you know, to talk about was this this war analogy, which was not it was part of the discussion. It wasn't part of Dr. Borelli's thing. Is the war analogy? I believe also is wrong because it's it's not long-lasting. You you go to war, you finish it. Everyone's a hero, and they go home. And what it's, this is, I like the natural disaster makes more sense to me as a, as a human. That is a long term progression of things that have to happen in sequence to be able to get back to a better place. I do think as the last thing, um, uh, this has accelerated some things that are good for CPAP users and apnea patients. Uh, the, uh, the talk about the, um, uh, drive through, getting your, your test and then dropping it off in a brown paper bag, you know, that that's going to create, I think, less friction for people getting tested uh, than having to come in, sit down, chit chat and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that's actually probably kind of a positive thing. And then the other thing is this telemedicine thing. When I had my problem with the diarrhea, you know, I was on, uh, on, on the telemedicine with, uh, with the doctors and I didn't have to go anywhere. And it was like three or four sessions kind of sorting it all out, what I should do. And I thought, you know what, that really worked. Um, and so I think this is going to help our patients in our community, I think, long run, because it's putting together a more accessible health care system. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just amazing, you know, that we were just talking about this yesterday, and, and Joe said that, and I was like, I know that Will is going to be able to, uh, you know, relate to this, but I'll tell you the, the whole, the whole experience is just, I mean, it's, it's almost surreal. If you think about some of the times and some of the experiences that you've had, I myself usually don't get, you know, very nervous about things, but I, I noticed there were a few nights where I couldn't sleep. I'd wake up and I'd have this sense of, Oh, you know, it's it's a horrible thing. Is everybody in my family going to survive? Is you know, I don't want anybody to die and you know, just horrible horrible things. I mean, it does to, you know, to people. My my, my favorite meme Teresa was the one that said uh don't worry about going to sleep tonight. It'll be worse tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I saw that too and I was like, "Oh, please no." No, I think it's really interesting during this whole thing. I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying every single person's sleep has changed in some way due to this. Mm. Um, I just think like taking a step back and recognizing that is pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. You know, San Juanita had an experience that I don't think. I would have, I don't think I would be okay talking right now. You, <laughs> what you went through with your sister, I just really, it you was know, really something. Could you tell them about that? Sure. Um, 
you know, we had my sister, uh, it's going to be almost a month uh, now, um, got very sick, uh, had to go into the hospital. And um, they were trying to figure out what was going on. And towards the end of the first, uh, the five days or so, they did test her when she first went in. Um, And it was towards the end of that week that she came back positive with COVID. Um, It's, it's being, it's sitting outside a parking area, not being able to know what's going on inside. It's conversing through phone. It's uh, hearing that this is happening and it's not just, I am positive, but guess what? All of you need to go get tested. Uh, It's kind of your blood runs cold. Um, And no longer was I watching the news and that I am part of the numbers. Um, The entire, there was at least six of us that rushed that morning to try to get tested and we couldn't because we had no symptoms. So you have to figure out a different way to get tested. And it wasn't enough that one member of our family was positive. So all of us paid for our tests. Uh, thank God there was a doctor here locally at that time who was providing testing at your own, either through your, your provider or uh, if you didn't have insurance, we paid our, our own. We couldn't wait for an appointment. So um, did, did you have the did you have the antibody test or was it a full? We had the the full one. Okay. We had the full one, and um, you wait. We waited about five excruciating days. You know, everybody's coughing in my house. Why are you coughing? You know what's going on. You talk about losing your sleep, and then making decisions about does she come and stay with us because her children? Well, they're nine, they're twenty and, and twenty eight, but I we still think you know we were talking. We've got other life ahead of them. We need to be the ones to take care of her so that they're safe. And then the children says, "No, we're taking our mama home because if something were to happen, you all are are uh, much older, and I've got all my senior citizens. You won't make it." You know, having those <laughs> conversations is really. Um, you know, just as surreal, as you said, as, as facing that. And we're not the only ones. And so talk about how it affects you. I, I couldn't put my machine on because I was suffocating, not because the machine wasn't working, because I had so much anxiety during those times. Um, so, you know, it, 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 interesting, because it was like when I had my panic attacks, and I've definitely had more in the last few months, just because uh-huh. We're, we're home all day long and, you know, not doing the exercise, not getting the rhythms are different. Um, I put my mask on. I get that engages my diaphragm. That's the only way I can relax. Sure. So it's interesting that you're feeling when you put it on, you can feel I could see how you could feel claustrophobic before it gets fully up the pressure and you can breathe into it or against it. Yeah, I just <laughs> I could not sleep. I mean, wow. I was just didn't want to wake up to the next day because I was afraid I was going to have fever. You know, I didn't want to hear anybody else sneezing or coughing or, uh, you know, it's just, it's such a difficult time and, and having to go back into society again in a very different way. You know, I've cried standing in line because I have to wear gloves and a mask. It's like, why is this happening? Um, so I think all of those things, uh, we've, ex- it's not unique to us. It's something as a family we've experienced. All of us tested negative. My sister took an antibiotic test and she was negative. She took the, the, the full test again and was negative. Um, so go figure. But, uh, you know, we hear the presidents and folks getting tested every day. You know, just, we, we just like to get tested once. I, I think getting tested is, is reassuring to people. Uh, I would, I would, I would, as a layman would say, you know, if, if we felt like the tests were, 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 were solidified and unique and global. I'd, I'd tell people to rush out and get them. Absolutely. But right now, I don't see the need to go out and get them unless you really need to. And you, you need to know that peace of mind because I think this is going to be around for a long time. Yes. And, and as a layman and, and not as, as the doctor, um, you know, right now, I think the safest thing we could do is maintain the physical distance, wear the mask, and hopefully we can, uh, our frontline and our central workers uh, can survive that we can start to make sense out of all this data that we're seeing. Uh, and hopefully with some, some coordinated leadership and some consolidation, we could actually start to turn the tide uh, in this country. I think we've done it as states, as individuals, as counties, as cities, but I just don't think you've seen it all, the, the so-called American spirit where we all come together because we're such a divided country right now. I think that's the shame of this this crisis more than anything is that we're not together and we've got eighty thousand plus people dead and we haven't mourned them yet and that's a problem for this country. So, thank you for for coming into this panel. 
ladies and gentlemen. Um, I uh, I really am uh, so happy that we could come together. Some of us are board members here at ASAA, and um, just I, I don't know about you, but I feel about today as as a real step forward for the organization in that you know it, it is it, it seems that patients and healthcare professionals have come together and and started the dialogue. I mean, we've been talking for a long time. We talk and talk and talk. But this is something different in 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 this surreal time that we're having. I, I really am proud of everybody for coming together and not being, oh, the patients, you know, I love the patients. So I'm so happy and grateful to all the experts that, that came along and for the hard work that everybody put into today. Adam, I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, Eugenia, San Juanita, Michael, and Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. San Juanita, Eugenia, Will, Dr. Graner, do you have any other sort of final thoughts? You know, not that we have to solve all the world's problems today, but, you know. We'll get through it together. That's right. I Try like to that. sleep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. Look across the board and see that we are all still standing. Amen. There are so many families and so many businesses that have lost so many loved ones. And yet I'm looking at everybody I met three years ago. Thank Be God. well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Eugenia. I don't think you could say that better. It, it's so nice to see you and to see San Juanita and to see the, the, the transition that you, that you both have made and all this. And now to have Teresa up and running and, and on, on the camera and really, you know, getting our community together. You know, Will and I have been walked into this organization seven, eight years ago and really were a little baffled by what we walked into. <laughs> and I got to say, uh, we, we made a conscious decision and we have no problem saying this in the public. It's like, do we go start our own organization or, or is there something here to salvage? And, and we just thought there was so much traffic coming to sleepapnea.org that it was a shame not to get these people the information. Uh, and I, I feel like we're on our way. I feel like the shared decision-making, the innovation, uh, the, the, the chronic disease that we represent is, is really given us a platform to, to not be married to any one discipline, to any one society, uh, and, and to really start to embrace this and, and, and to be the outlet and the, the one-stop shop as far as the education and the trusted source uh, for our community. And I, and I think we're, we're on our way to doing that. I look forward to what the future holds. Uh, I'm, I'm saddened by what I'm seeing happen across all the nonprofits, but at the same time, I think this is uh, just like Mother Nature is getting its balance back. I think, you know, in some ways, that world is too. You know, it's it's it's. We were ready to make the virtual flip. We weren't we weren't dependent on one channel of revenue. Uh, we know that we need to to be able to, to to still offer these services to our public, even though the, the the medical system doesn't doesn't provide for it right now, like the diabetes community. So I, I think we've 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 done a lot this year in the midst of all this craziness. Um, but at the same time, we have a long way to go. And I think this is, like they said, the start of something really good. Uh, I look forward to having more conversations with, with more of the, the doctors, not only domestically, but internationally from the different disciplines uh, and from all the different stakeholders. I, th I think the more, once we get the insurers in here and the device companies and, and, the, and, and the regulators, I think we're going to start to actually be able to do something when, when, this, when this is said and done, when people figure out that we can manage this and come up for air. Our Awake Angels is very simple, is that people can make donations to sleepapnea.org and they can help provide replacement factory sealed masks for our patients that can't afford them. The most important thing we can do for those that are at home right now is make sure that they have access to their resupplies. Come to sleepapnea.org, visit our CPAP assistance program and see that if you need resupply masks that we have them there for you and we've helped over 7,000 individual patients get a full machine and mask hookup over the last few years and we're proud of that obviously right now in this day and age there's there's a major need for machines and masks and anything we can do to get them out to our patients is 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 what we want to do